so far. So I'm told. I'm told um, we stopped at um, strategies for prevention. So we'll continue from there. Can, can, can we go over the prevention again, please? Uh, please, if you want to go about you, that prevention, you will need to go and watch that from um, the YouTube channel. We can't go back, please. Oh, okay, okay. It has been taught before. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Oh, um, so, um, what's that then? I Okay, so look, um, strategies for prevention. Um, I know we've covered prevention. Um, I'll just say one or two things and then we'll just continue from there. Um, basically, there are levels of prevention and um, you'll be, these include um, primordial, primary, secondary, tertiary and tertiary prevention. Um, and some are also beginning to talk of quaternary presently. Um, while some believe that primordial can be uh, merged into, um, into primary, basically for the primordial, you, you don't even want the risk factor, just see it as something you do to prevent the risk factor from um, occurring in the population in the first place. While for the primary, the risk factor is there, but you don't want the disease to occur. Then in the secondary, the disease has occurred, then you want to um, have early diagnosis and prompt treatment to prevent complications from taking place. While for the, um, for the tertiary, um, complications have occurred. However, you want to limit disability you know, and rehabilitate to, in order for them to um, attain some level of, attain their uh, maximum level of functioning um, despite the complications that might have occurred. Then quaternary, some um, equate it to over medicalization. So basically, those um, are the levels of prevention. So for the approaches now, um, these are ways through which um, you know the various way, uh, levels of prevention are carried out. Um, looking at this slide, um, the WHO has recommended the following approaches for primary prevention of chronic diseases where the risk factors are established. One, we have the population or mass strategy. And then two, um, the high risk strategy. However, I would, um, I've, looked, I've tried to look through this myself, um, but I think that um, there are still more to it, but though not in this notes, but I'll just start then, I'll just tell us where to look up from. So for the population or mass strategy, these two are actually um, strategies under primary prevention, uh, ways through which primary prevention um, can um, take place. Um, just before I forget, for the premodal, that one is basically through law legislation and the likes that would um, prevent the risk factors from um, occurring. So for the mass strategy, it's directed at a whole population in, um, irrespective of individual risk levels. For example, studies have shown that even a small reduction in the av um, average blood pressure or serum cholesterol of a population will produce a large reduction in the incidence of cardiovascular disease. Um, the population approach is directed towards socioeconomic, behavioral, and lifestyle changes. So this, for the mass strategy, is directed as the whole strategy. You don't just like carve out a target population or look out for a vulnerable or um, a high risk um, group and target them, but you just do it on the whole. Examples would be things like, um, um, maybe the fortification of um, salt that is done on a general level, 
you know, we all get to, it reaches everyone. It's not, you know, done at a particular place or, you know, something like that. The whole population or the whole country is targeted. So, and a host of other um, prevention strategies like that. We have iodine in um, salt, vitamin A, and um, in flour, um, and some other examples like that that you could give. So it's targeted at the whole population. Then the high risk strategy aims to bring prevention care to individuals at special risk. This require um, detection of the individuals at high risk by the optimum use of clinical methods. So for this particular group, you look out for who are those that are at high risk. Take for example, a common example you find in our environment is women attending antenatal. We know that generally these women are at risk of anemia. And so, um, one of the strategies is that um, we give them um, pesolates and folic acid, um, folic acid because of, you know, trying to also prevent um, the NTDs. So you look at the population at risk and target your intervention towards that one to prevent um, the disease from occurring. Though, however, these people um, may already be at risk. So you prevent you know, the disease from occurring in them through these strategies. I'm sure there are a host of other examples um, we could give for that. We'll also talk about um, vitamin A supplementation among the under fives, you know. That, that is also um, a high risk strategy. So you target a particular group or, you know, that is at risk. So, like I said earlier on, this population uh, or mass strategy and the um, high risk strategy are actually ways for um, achieving um, primary prevention. However, for um, secondary prevention, you'll be talking about um, screening and case finding. That is the strategy under, um, under secondary prevention. For the screening, the purpose is to um, evaluate a group of people who are apparently healthy, uh, healthy persons for asymptomatic disease or risk factor. So a case would be like um, looking out for um, hypertension or, um, or diagnosing diabetes in a population, maybe through your outreaches. These people are healthy. And that's something that is key in screening is that they are apparently healthy. They didn't come to you because they are sick or they have one issue or the other, but you screen them to check. So, and this um, check, what it helps you to do is a part of the secondary prevention that is early detection. And when you are able to detect a disease early, that will also help, help you to um, give prompt intervention. Um, another um, way to carry out strategy for the secondary prevention um, will be case finding. In this instant now, these ones are, um, you wouldn't really say they are, they are not, um, maybe they came to you for one reason or the other, um, but then you decided to screen them. So an example is a woman um, who is, say, in the hospital setting pantenetal, but you decide to screen her for, um, syphilis, decide to, you know, screen her for um, anemia, you know, screen for, as, um, for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, you know, you check um, her genotype and all that. So you just use the opportunity of her contact with the healthcare to um, check for diseases. So in this case, um, or somebody who is um, came to say MOPD um, for one reason or the other, um, maybe you just think that what may really be wrong with this individual may just be maybe malaria, but all the
if it's in blood sugar, you do, um, you take the person's blood pressure and all that, that would be case finding. So the strategies under the secondary prevention will be screening and then um, case finding. Um, so that one isn't to just look at it plainly in that way. Um, limitation of disability. So um, take, for example, a driver who was involved in an accident and, and has lost a limb. Um, he may not be able to go back to driving, but at least you can give him a better quality of life by giving him a prosthetic and then he'll be able to maybe at least move around do other things or even find um another job that will make his life better and um the rehabilitation cuts across um different spectrum physical mental social and economic in such a way that he or she um is more useful to him or herself okay so um, um, move on to disease control. What do we mean by the term control? So the concept, uh, the concept of control des describes an ongoing operation aimed at one, reducing incidence of disease, two, reducing the duration of disease, and um, this will consequently reduce its risk of transmission. And then also reducing the effects of infection, including both the physical and psychosocial complications. That is, in, in, in simple terms, that is to reduce the sequelae. And then four, the financial burden to the community or even individual and the nation as a whole. So if, um, we're looking at control. There are four things that should come to your mind. One, you are reducing incidence. You are reducing duration. I know this will uh, consequently reduce to reduction in prevalence because as we know, the formula for um, prevalence is incidence times duration. So if you reduce incidence, you reduce duration, you consequently will reduce prevalence. And then, um, and when you reduce disease duration, the risk of transmission is shortened. Um, look, look at it in this way. Um, let's say for certain infectious diseases, you would say um, it takes, say, about maybe many of those viral infectious diseases, maybe for it to run its natural course, it may take like about um, 15 days or so, you know. Um, Maybe the period of infectivity is about um, 15 days or thereabout. But then, if you introduce, say, maybe a viral disease may not be a good example. Let's just say bacteria. You give an antibiotic. Um, for some of the diseases, the antibiotic reduces this duration of the disease. So the shorter this person has the disease, the less likely it is for other people to come in contact with such an individual. And that will reduce the risk of the disease being transmitted um, to other people. So let's say if a disease was normally to run a course of about 15 days, if it's now reduced to like seven days or thereabouts, then the people or the contacts which this person would have had for another seven days are taken out of the way. So the risk of transmission is reduced. Um, then talking about complications, if, um, it's also part of when you, you have a reduction in the number of complications, and that is because um, you have reduced incidence, you reduced duration. Um, the likelihood is that there'll be a reduction in um, the complication. And then um, looking at it too, um, talking about morbidity and mortality, we know that being um, an, a, a disease individual, you know, having a disease could mean um, 
you know, could become a burden to an individual financially because you have to get yourself treated in order to get better. Some that could be uh, I think such as, you know, as absenteeism from work. You know, this, this is an economic cost, you know, the worker himself, you know. Um, and then even the general um, national, you know, economy, you know, having a, you know, a large group of your citizenry being diseased, you know, you know, hamper the development of a country. So, so when you control a disease, you actually reduce both um, the financial burden, both to individuals, families, communities, and the nation as a whole. So whenever talking of control, you should have these four in mind. One, reduction of in incidence. Two, reduction of duration of disease. Consequently, this is a reduction of risk of transmission reduction of, in, um, of sequelae, and this could be physical, psychosocial, you know, and other ways, and then um, reduction in financial burden, both to um, individuals, families, communities, and the nation as a whole. So to control a disease, however, um, a good knowledge of the organism is necessary. So you need to know the most vulnerable stage where you can institute your control measure. You know, and um, so you need to identify the weak points um, where you may institute one or more measures. Um, for example, is in the case of um, malaria. So we know that um, the control of malaria has been through various ways, and um, this is based on the good knowledge of how this um, disease is transmitted, how it runs its, um, how it runs its course and the like. So one, we know that um, these mosquitoes are likely to breed in, you know, where you have um, maybe stagnant waters, especially for anopheles, which is um, um, referred to as um, the, I think Anopheles is a sophisticated mosquito. So it's, it's like when you have any bowl of water anywhere, it is likely to breed in it. Um, your water in your, um, um, any water left in a bowl, let's say in, uh, in, in, in a tank that is uncovered, you know, and the lights, it's, it's likely to breed. Where you have um, the place is bushy and all that, it is likely to breed there. And so, um, that is a, a place we are seeing um, in its, you know, in how it, it runs its course. And then we also know that um, the bites mostly at dawn and at dusk. So that is also um, an area where we can institute our control. So looking at it right from there and um, all the way to how it runs its course, you now want to know at which point Um, um, let's say in the case of malaria now, because it is a vector borne disease, you have what you call um, vector control. So you, you, you use as many means as possible to bring about the control. So in, this, in the light of what is known about the cause of the disease, you, we, we now have um, you know, trying to environmental sanitation, keeping your environment, you know, clean, um, ensuring that um, um, water in containers are covered, um, that there are no stagnant water around the house, bushes are cleared. So that's some sort of environmental control, which can both be physical and also chemical, you know, and even biological has been, can also be used, which is um, actually the best way and to control um, vectors, you know, using as many means as possible in, in, in an integrated way. And then um, 
screening of the windows of the doors you know would also prevent the um, vector from getting into the house and then um you know biting individuals also for the individuals to ensure that they are also covered you know so the use of insect search um long-lasting intestinal treated nets too is also one of the um, strategy being used and for um individuals who are also um ill you also have to institute um a, you know it has to be diagnosed early to start with and then tr treated promptly so now we talk of rapid diagnostic tests for malaria and then you know you treat with act which are um proven to be um useful um also, um, we now have um, um, intermittent um, um, prophylactic treatment also being introduced. So apart from that, which we know in pregnant women, um, another strategy has been started where um, even it started um, from the north, where the high risk group um, are also being given um, prophylactic treatments for uh, malaria. Um, that is referring to the under five. And so control may occur at any of the three levels. One is control at the reservoir or source, control um, of the root, and then control at the level of the susceptible host. So we'll be looking at um, this control at this tree level. So this is just um, really saying the same thing with the previous slide. So controlling at the level of the reservoir or source, um, this depends on the reservoir, whether it is an animal reservoir or a human reservoir. Sorry, please give me a minute. Hello, am I still being heard? Hello. Hello. We can hear you actually. Okay. So controlling the reservoir or source. Um, this depends on the reservoir, whether animal or human. Um, so for the animal, you could control by um um eliminating them through various means, whether use of um, chemicals, you know, physical and the likes. Like in the case of rodents, you could use traps, you know, um, mosquitoes, we've talked about the various ways we can eliminate them. And then in, in the case of other reservoirs, such as um, um, dogs, uh, which are reservoirs for rabies, we vaccinate them. So, however, um, this may not apply to human. Um, you cannot eliminate a man because he has a disease. However, um, you could also vaccinate him. And then um, um, early diagnosis, um, notification, isolation, or, uh, and, uh, or quarantine. Um, though in this case now, it's, you'll be talking of quarantine when you're talking about a contact, then um, treatment of a case. Um, others could um, include um, 
disinfection and um, epidemiological investigation of um, epidemics. Okay, so I'll just take them one after the other. Like for the case of the human um, reservoir, early diagnosis, um, this would um, include rapid identification of cases and carriers for um, treatments. Um, for for you to, um, to target the reservoir, in the case of a human, um, it's rapid identification of cases is actually very important. If you're able to die, um, identify a case early, you're able to treat, and also if it's a contagious um, agent um, that the person is being infected with, you're also able to institute other measures to prevent spread. Um, disease investigation, that's a whole other topic, um, which maybe we're likely to um, cover with time. Then, you know, you have maybe one or two cases coming up and then there's a notification and then you have to institute your, um, um, you have to investigate the disease and that is a whole um, step, you know, starting from your preliminary measures to um, come up with your team, you know, build up your team that will go into the field um, to investigate first and foremost. Um, one, if it's an endemic disease, is it actually, um, no, to even find out in the first place whether um, the agent causing the disease, to identify what is the agent causing the disease, and then if it is actually happening to an extent, you know, greater than what is normal. Let's say if all the while, there are certain diseases that a single case you consider an, an epidemic and investigate. However, there are some diseases that are endemic that are certain level, and then you want to check, based on this level we've been having over the years, has there been a peak, is there a rise that is above normal? And then um, this will require investigation and now taking, you know, finally doing your descriptive epidemiology, then you, um, while controlling in the process of the investigation also, and then you disseminate and feedback, and then it's um, all the way. Okay. So, um, usually there are diseases for notification. And um, these diseases are um, are grouped. They are grouped um, under about um, four um, subheadings. So, um, they are those that are are targeted for control. There are those that are um, targeted for elimination. There are also those that are targeted for um, eradication. And the first ones are those that are public health. Maybe after this, what I can do is to share with us the ideas of the uh, document. Hello? Also, please, can you repeat the fourth one? You cut off at that point. Okay. So I said that there are those targeted for control, those targeted for um, elimination, those targeted for eradication, and those of public health importance. Okay. So I I'll try to share that um, later. Um, and... Um, Important of note when you are talking about the international notification is the IHR, International Health Regulation, um, which the most um, recent document is that of um, um, 2005. Um, I don't want us to go too much into that so that we don't derail. Um, it's a total um, different topic on its own, but basically, I just want us to take note of those. Um, for Nigeria, uh, most importantly, we should take note of 
the first three, which are things that could possibly uh, be an NCQ. So, and then I'll give us a code on how to remember. So we have those in Nigeria um, that are targeted for, um, for control. Um, a code you can use to remember is MOT, M O T H. Those are the ones targeted for control. Malaria, onchocerciasis, or uh, what is also referred to as um, river blindness, and then HIV AIDS, tuberculosis and HIV AIDS. So that is the moat, those that are targeted for control in Nigeria. So that means you want to um, reduce it to a certain level. Basically, I, I, and let's not forget, for the definition of control is actually your aim is to reduce to a certain level such that it is no more of public health importance. So for these four diseases, the target is that it should be reduced to a certain level such that it is no longer of public health importance. So you are going to reduce in terms of morbidity, mortality, and also um, consequently reduce the financial burden to the community. Um, I so, and then um, there are those that are targeted for um, elimination. And um, this includes measles, tetanus, actually the neonatal tetanus, um, lymphatic filariasis, leprosy, and chagas. So a code you can use to remember this is LFT, that is um, liver function test, MC, or MC, LFT. Uh, so these are the ones that are targeted for elimination. So what that means is that you're trying to um, bring the disease you know, as we go on, I'll be talking about, we'll still go ahead and, be, you know, talk about um, elimination and eradication. But basically, what elimination means is that um, is you are doing it in a specific geographical area. Let's say like in the case of polio now, where um, we have brought it under control, such that there haven't been cases reported um, for a while now. At a point, it was just the um, circulating vaccine derived ones, you know, and, you know, with the introduction of IPT now, all that would um, go out of the way. So if you are just stopping polio from occurring in Nigeria, that will be referred to as elimination. So you just have like um, a region or geographical area. But when you now talk about a global, um, elimination like worldwide it's it's no more occurring then that that is that is now referred to as eradication um there's another terminology referred to as extinction such that um it's not just that it is not occurring worldwide but is that it's not even present whether in lab it's not existent at all let's say um a disease that has been eliminated for example is smallpox However, we still have it um, in about four labs in the world, in three or four labs thereabouts, you know, and um, a stock of vaccine and all that. So let's just take note of that, um, those terminologies. So- Doc, sorry, please. Can, I wanted to ask you a question. The yes. LFTMCT, what do they stand for, please? L is for leprosy. Yes. Um, T is for tetanus. F yes. is for what? L, filariasis, lymphatic filariasis. Okay, what about the M and C? Um, the M is measles, and C is measles, cholera. Okay. I mean, sorry, C is okay. Chagas disease. Chagas disease, thank you. Yes. And the tetanus is actually neonatal tetanus. And then those targeted for elimination, um, what you can use, the code you can use is PIG. 
pig with a y p y g pig so that is poliomyelitis yours and guinea worm those are um, the ones that are targeted for eradication um, so um a, a, a reference document also, please can you come again with the names of the diseases okay um p poliomyelitis y yours y a w s then um guinea worm have have you gotten that yes that's uh, thank you so much all right so welcome okay so uh, uh, um a reference material to be good to read will be the IHR of um, 2000 and, um, 2005. So maybe when we get to international health, uh, we we'll would cover that well and um, also talk about the integrated disease um, survey. Should be notified, you know, um, if and whether in the community or in the hospital setting. For us in the hospital setting, if you begin to disease would notify the disease notification area council, um, disease notification officer at the area council um, who further um, take it ahead to the state and states to the federal government. Um, so that is the line of flow. So whether a tertiary institution, whether within the primary healthcare setting or a secondary institution, you know, all the notification goes through that flow from those institutions to the local government, to the state, then to the federal government. And um, within that, um, along that route, at either point, it has to get to the WHO. So isolation. This is still part of um, ways of controlling um, disease at the source, talking about human in the case of human now. So for the isolation, um, what, it's, what you have noticed to remember that when you are talking of isolation, you are talking of cases. And when you are talking of quarantine, you are talking of contacts. So the person who passed the disease, who is a confirmed case of the disease, you isolate. While for a person who is a contact of the disease and there is no um, confirmation whatsoever, you quarantine. So for isolation, it's a separation. You know, why I try to make this clear, um, people tend to use it um, interchangeably. But in public health, it's actually, they are not the same. I know, um, especially during this period of COVID, you hear of self-isolate, self-isolate. Um, what they were actually doing was quarantine and not isolation. Okay, so Doc, so the difference is isolation. The person is already infected. Yes. So and you want Confirm to separate. Yes. Confirm, but for quarantine, is it may contact? Be. Okay, okay. Contact with, the, with an infected person. Yes, yes. Okay. However, you haven't confirmed it. Or the point the individual is... Um, it may be at a point where even if you carry out a test, you may not speak it. So you quarantine such an individual. So um, isolation sep uh, is separation for a period of communicability of um, infected persons or animals to prevent the spread of the infectious disease. So for many diseases um, where the natural history is known, um, for, especially for many of the viral diseases, there are periods when we call the period of infectivity, which is the period within which this individual is infectious and is able to um, um, transmit the disease to another individual who comes um, in contact with him or her. Um, via the roots of um, transmission for that particular disease. Um, take, for example, for a case of measles, 
which is a viral exanthem. Usually, the person is infectious two days before the onset of the rash and um, four days after the onset of the rash. So, um, looking at this, there's, for that period that is before the onset of the rash, there's actually nothing much um, you can do. But then once the rash has appeared, it's, it's um, said that for the school child, you keep the child away from school until all the crusts have fallen before the child returns to school. So in a way, you're isolating this person from other children to prevent him or her from transmitting the disease to other children. Um, so the purpose is to protect others and it can be hospital based or at home. Uh, actually, this depends on the um, and severity of the disease. Like say in the case of measles, uh, if, it's, if, it's, if, if it isn't complicated, you actually can isolate at home. And then chicken pox um, and cholera, those are some of the diseases um, that um, one needs to isolate. Um, we should take note of that of cholera. We know that in our practice, we don't really, we kind of don't really isolate um, cholera patients, but ideally, patients with cholera should be isolated. Uh, so, and then don't isolate diseases with considerable number of carriers. Um, example is um, polio, um, hepatitis A virus, and um, um, typhoid eye salmonellosis. Um, like we know for um, for these particular diseases, you have um, many carriers. Um, I know we've discussed carriers before, and there could be a whole um, spectrum of carriers, whether the covalent, the healthy, um, the incubatory, the um, no, what do you call them? There are about five of them. There are about um, uh, the next maybe the next time I'll just try to get us a list. Um, um, what I usually use is chips. C H I P S. So it could be so, but for certain diseases. Um, where you have so many carriers, it, it, it actually doesn't make sense to isolate a certain group of individuals who have the disease because uh, there are also many others who are carrying the disease out there and who are spreading it. So, um, uh, so these are not not routinely done nowadays because of um, improved um, technology. So they are not many where they are being isolated. But for us in the developing countries, we know that um, um, for many of these, we still um, kind of try to um, isolate them to um, reduce further spread. We know that out there, there might be early, early detection. So they have like a longer um, lead time compared to maybe those of us in the developed country. There are so many you know, resources out there for them. But routinely for us, when we detect in a setting for some of these things, we either um, isolate either at home or in the hospital. So quarantine is limitation of um, freedom of movement of well or um, people or domestic animals exposed to a communicable disease for a period of time um, not longer than the incubation period of that disease. So I know this um, is not so far from us. We just went through um, COVID in the year 2020 and um, there was a lot of quarantine and all. And um, what you have noted is the fact that it's the um, longest incubation period. Usually, um, most diseases, the incubation period is quoted as a range. You hear like one to five days, um, take for example, um, I think Lassa fever or so, we have um, 
about um, six or so to 21 days. So you usually have a range. So if I want to quarantine that individual, I, I wouldn't do that for six days. You know, I'll do it for longer period. The, the, um, I'll go for the upper border, which is 21. So in the case of COVID, you know, we're doing all the 14 days and all that. Um, so, um, and the, but why you are trying to, why you are keeping this individual is to see whether this individual will develop the disease within that period of quarantine. If he or she develops the disease or within the period of quarantine test positive for the disease, then that becomes a case. And what you now do is isolation. Um, so this can be applied to an uh, to aircraft ship etc and it's actually basically restriction of healthy contacts um, um, when this initially started it used to be 40 days um, quarantine actually from the root word where it is derived is 40 days where it was done at the ports of entry so let me just um, take note of that however presently what is practiced in the modern time is to isolate individual for a period of time equal to the longest incubation period of that disease. Interruption of transmission. Um, so um, it simply just means to break the chain of transmission. And um, this may mean um, altering the environment, um, like we're dis discussing at the beginning of um, where I was talking about integrated vector control. So you, it's like you just, you have an idea or a knowledge of the natural history of the disease, you know, and you know, how the disease goes from um, the reservoir through the portal of exit, then um, via a, a portal of entry, then gets to a susceptible individual, then exits again, I know the circle continues. So having that in mind, um, you could actually interrupt at any path um, possible along this pathway. So it may involve altering the environment, e.g. in water, um, water treatment, um, in the case of cholera outbreak, um, where you have um, um, super, if one of the things could be um, super um, chlorination of wells, if there's a suspected well, uh, which is the source of infection, um, alteration of the um, vector breeding site, like we talked about, um, um, you know, clearing of bushes, ensuring that there's no stagnant water or even the um, um, use of um, um, certain chemicals, you know, to alter the environment and make it unfavorable for their breeding. Um, then for bacteria and viral diseases and the likes, you could um, hand hygiene. Um, that is to get the organism of the hand such that it doesn't get transmitted to the susceptible individual or respiratory etiquettes um, to prevent the um, organism from exiting from the infected individual and getting to the susceptible individual um, via um, a portal of entry. So how can we protect the host? Um, we are still talking about control. Um, so this can be via active immunization, passive immunization, or chemoprophylaxis. Active immunization in the sense that um, you introduce the antigen into um, the individual, and then the body of that individual um, produces um, immunity to, you know, fight against the offending organism. So 
in that case, since it's the individual who is producing the immunity, it's an active immunity. And um, so for many of our immunizations that we do, um, for the under fives and the likes, hepatitis and all that, um, what we are actually doing is giving them um, um, active immunization. Then for the passive, is that you are giving preformed antibody or you know or products to the individual. So the individual is not the one um, who is producing or who is fighting the um, antigen or producing um, antibodies to fight. The organism. So in that case, it is passive. So like when you give um, serum, an example of something that has a both active and passive is tetanus. When you give the serum, um, what you're doing is passive immunization. But when you um, give the toxoid, the person is going to be the one to actively produce. So that is active immunization. Then yeah, okay. The, what about the passive? It is not the host that actively produces the the antibody. Yes. 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 That is, you are introducing that is, the antibody directly. Yes. Essentially, that is what you are doing. So you just look at it. Yeah. The, the 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 host or the person, the vaccine is not the person who is producing um, the antibody. The antibody, but rather they are being given preformed. Um, antibody. Yes. Okay. So that is passive. What about the chemoprophylaxis? Okay. For the chemoprophylaxis, that one is not an immunization. Yes. Uh, like you said, it's uh, completely separate. But rather, yeah. you, are, you are giving to prevent exactly. the person oh. from coming down with the disease. This person yes. doesn't have it yet. Yeah. Yes. So, and we have chemoprophylaxis being practiced for um, several uh, diseases. Like I talked about the malaria now, apart from um, you give to pregnant women, you give to travelers uh, moving from non-endemic to endemic areas. We also okay. give to um, under fives presently. So that is the case of chemoprophylaxis. And some of the um, parasitic diseases too. We also do chemoprophylaxis. So a susceptible host. So for a susceptible host, um, you can give the individual um, active immunization. So it means this, you know, because this individual is however, he or she is susceptible but does not have the disease yet so likely has the time to um, produce still has the time to produce the antibody so you give um, active immunization and this can be done in cases like uh, polio tetanus um, measles then passive immunization um, can, um, that is where you give immunoglobulins those are the antibodies um, it's done for um, done for tetanus, it's done for um, rabies, it's done for rabies and, and other. Um, then for the chemoprophylaxis, I, was, I already talked about the IPT. Um, I think this would be a good place to stop. It's actually at um, 8 o'clock now. Um, Dr. Okaku? I don't know if there are any questions for the ones we've taken so far. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Doctor, thank you so much for your time. Please, can you uh, repeat the MOTH um, for diseases targeted for control? The T stands for tuberculosis. Okay. Moth, LFT, and MC, you, and PIG. Okay, you, 
Yeah, you mentioned another acronym, CHIPS. Sorry, yes. yes, what does that stand for? Um, those are the um, career states that are possible. So I said um, it could be a covalent career. That is um, somebody who is recovering from this disease, but still actively shedding the organism and is able to transmit and pass to individual and get an individual infected. Then a healthy carrier. Um, I think for polio, polio still has, polio has covalent carriers. Then um, for salmonellosis, um, I'll try, I'll, by the next, um, by the next um, session, I'll get us a list of all that so that at least we have it in mind. Then for healthy carriers, these individuals are healthy, but are actively shedding the organism. An example is the case of salmonellosis. Popular in history is um, Mary Typhoid, who was a food vendor, was actively shedding almost all her life and had to be isolated. Then incubatory carrier, this also occurs in polio, which means during that period of incubation, um, where the individual is not even showing symptoms of the disease, the person is actively shedding and infecting others. Um, um, I can't remember the other two, but I'll try to get it across to us. Uh, okay, so, so there are several of them. The, the, the acronym, the PYG, right? The polio, the yours, and the guinea worm. It is for the, uh, the disease that needs to be eradicated or eliminated. Esti uh, does eradicated, extinction. actually. Uh, eradicated. Yes, right, the... but there's no disease under extinction. It's eradication. If you are talking about regional elimination, if you are talking about global eradication, well, then okay, extinction uh, is where the organism is neither, there's no um, transmission occurring and it's not even available in the lab. So it has gone into extinction. And so far, we don't have any disease under that group. Mm -hmm. But for eradication, what we have, what has been eradicated worldwide is smallpox so far. Smallpox. Yes. What about However, the, we still have it in lab, so we can't say it's, it's extinct. It's extinct. Yes. So, look, what about this uh, LFTMC? What, what, is that for eradication too? Is that for? Okay. Uh, I'll, let me just take it maybe one more time. So, um, going um, it's like going from the least to the highest, or how will I say now? It's it's the kind of hi uh, hierarchy. Um, control. Elimination, eradication, extinction. Okay. Control. You just don't want it to. You want it to come to a point where it's no longer of public health importance. It's not as yes. if it's not occurring. You know, there are still cases in the society, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. um, the level or the burden of the morbidity and mot mortality is no longer of public health importance to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for these diseases, what you have is more. M O T H, yeah. Malaria, onchocerciasis, tuberculosis, HIV AIDS. Then elimination. Then for elimination, which is a step higher than um, control, which is higher than control. Now it's you are saying it might be occurring in other parts of the world, though. But for this particular region, say Nigeria, I don't want it occurring again. So it's a particular, it's a region. So for this one, what you have is um, the LFTMC. Yes. That is the lep um, leprosy, filariasis, specifically the lymphatic filariasis. Um, <laughs> excuse me. Tetanus. Neonatal. That is neonatal tetanus. Then the MC is measles and Chagas disease. This for elimination. Chagas, that is the other form of an African trypanosomiasis, the American form. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then for those that are for eradication, that means the world is working at it in such a way that we don't want it occurring in any part of the world. We want to stop transmission globally. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and that includes polio, yours, and guinea worm. Yes, sir. Thank you.
Chief, thank you very much, Chief. Yes, I no appreciate it. So, um, thank you very much, Chief. I appreciate so much for your efforts. And um, we thank you for all you've done. And we expect that um, we believe that subsequent lectures um, we will also turn up. Thank you very much once more. We do appreciate So once more, let's all thank her very much. Um, you will in a short notice. You, you thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Thank you. So I'll okay. do my best. And maybe the next time, um, I'll try to get us at least some group of books that will be very helpful. Um, Parks, Obionu, those are indigenous texts that will really be helpful. Thank you. Okay, thank you very thank much. You, Doctor. Thank you very much, Etubi. Um, meanwhile, um, before we end this class today, who among you um, is willing to become the, 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 the class rep that we can be communicating with? One the class when I start class rep. Who is volunteering? I need someone that has been consistent all this while. Who is volunteering now? I volunteer, doctor. Okay. Who is, who is, who is assisting? I would assist. Okay. So what to do? You guys should send me a WhatsApp message so I can. So Shukura, you are the class rep. Justice, you are the assistant class rep. So we pass information to you guys. You guys will be passing it to the forum. Yes. Then if if you guys can discuss with yourself, if it is not comfortable, we time we can adjust time to get yes. and if you have any topic you feel like you want us to discuss your exam is it's two months time from now november though it usually comes up towards the end of november it can also come up middle of, uh, or beginning of november so i'm assuming the exam is from the first week of november so we have your september october to sort to sort this this issue out yes sir. so um so please send me a message, Jim. So uh, meanwhile, good night, everybody. Good night, doctor. Thank you so much. Thank you, doctor. Thank you.